Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thanks for this opportunity. Uh, Greg in, invited me to talk about uh, joint work with Anthony Braga, who is chair of the criminology at Northeastern University these days. Um, and a couple of his graduate students that takes advantage of, of an extraordinary data set that he collected in, in Boston. Uh, over the years with uh, me acting as nudge rather than as uh, the, a worker bee. Uh, and uh, just to respond to what we just heard, I, I will say one audience for this paper so far has been the Boston Police Department. Uh, so we did go back to them, and I think that's important in research of, of this sort. Um, and uh, it is coming out. Uh, any day now in criminology and in public policy. All right. So the context for this research, which is about, uh, sure enough, policing gun violence, uh, is uh, first that arrest rates and conviction rates for serious gun violence have uh, been trending down uh, over the decades. Uh, as best we can tell. It's one of those things that is very hard to measure reliably and, and so that uh, it may or may not be true, but it certainly seems to be true in um, a couple of the cities that we are most familiar with. Uh, that that occurs in a context where there is, um, in, in a sense, um, a downgrading of the importance of detective work by the part of the police, uh, and th th that, um, what, what I imagine in the good old days, the, that kind of commitment to, to bringing wrongdoers to justice, it, in fact, has been supplanted to a very large extent by the embrace of what is called proactive policing, uh, and so that instead of responding to calls and, and, and responding to crimes that have already been um, committed, it, it is just to uh, try to st uh, interrupt them uh, before they are committed, and that that's seen somehow as being a higher calling. Uh, certainly the entry of the public health field into gun violence prevention and really taking control of that notion, uh, and, and with a tendency to exclude um, police detective work and arrest and conviction in, in their definition of that. Uh, endless number of research agendas that have been propounded recently as an enormous new sources of revenue for research in this area have, have flowed in. Uh, if you look at those agendas coming out of medical associations, public health associations, and other sources, you do not find anything about uh, investigating crime as a possibility. And so that this has become this great neglected area, which uh, I think if we had gone back uh, several decades, we would have said is the most important public response um, because of the deterrent effect, because of the incapacitation effect, uh, reflecting on, on the idea um, of, uh, that Charles was talking about uh, of, of contagion. It is also interrupting a contagion process and a variety of other mechanisms that we might think about are accomplished by successful police investigation that results in imprisonment of uh, people who shoot other people illegally, okay? So that's the context uh, that, in fact, it's important, uh, I think, to revive uh, commitment to this approach. Uh, but the paper is not about the potential consequences of doing that or accomplishing that. Uh, I take that as given, I believe in it, uh, as um, a guy uh, imbued with the economics of crime. Uh, but rather, I uh, and Anthony in this paper focus on a question that may strike you as a bit odd if you uh, are not a criminologist, and that is uh, whether or not it is feasible to increase the arrest rate for um, serious gun assault and homicide. That is, are there things the police could do better or more of that would actually accomplish that purpose, or is it hopeless uh, in this area? And the answer that we have um, 
let me reassure you is that there are things that can be done uh, and our particular focus is on non-fatal gunshot cases but uh, the, the same lesson I think also applies applies to fatal. Okay, so just to document uh, a, a basic fact that is relevant to our story um, and that is that gunshot cases that occur in criminal assaults uh, tend to be in, in fact quite random in terms of their outcome. About one in six victims of a criminal attack that results in a gunshot wound, about one in six die. Apparently that is still about right. Um, and the difference between those who live and those who die, to a very large extent, is a matter of chance. Uh, nonetheless, even though that in, in terms of the, the, what these cases look like in a variety of dimensions, uh, there is a, a large difference in the clearance rate by arrest. That is the likelihood that the case will result in the arrest by the police. That's not um, a statistic that is routinely collected, but we had data for Milwaukee for 11 years. Uh, and the median gap was 47 percentage points between the arrest rate for gun homicide and the arrest rate for non-fatal gun attacks that could have been a homicide if the bullet had uh, relocated by half an inch or whatever it was. Um, Chicago, we found 28 percentage point over a number of years. I did a study uh, for one year in Durham, North Carolina, and there it was 40 percentage points. Uh, and I am sure as I can be that whatever your favorite large city, if you went out and looked at it, you would find the same result. Uh, why is that? Well. The, the, the first thing to be said about it uh, is that police departments respond to fatal gunshot cases much different than they do to non-fatal. Uh, most large city departments have um, a detectives bureau or, or an investigator bureau uh, and there's a homicide squad which is separate and distinct from the, the group of detectives that investigates other serious felonies uh, and, and so that, that it's clear that there's something very different in, in terms of what the police are doing and the question is whether that's warranted and what effect it, it has and, and uh, what, are, what are the immediate consequences. So um, this is not like I was taught in, in economics graduate school, but I decided it might be useful to go talk to a bunch of detectives. So uh, we did that. We, 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 uh, we, we actually talked to 17 um, investigators in Durham uh, who all had work cases of the sort, gunshot cases, and we said, tell us about your work and, and um, about investigating these cases. and, and they said, oh, it's really tough and, and we don't get any cooperation from the community and, you know, if somebody survives, they're, they're likely to disappear rather than uh, tell us who shot them, even though they very often know and so on and so on. So they, they gave us the, the hard luck story uh, uh, about how hard their job is. We all have that story about our own jobs. Uh, and we had come up with... Um, a question, though, that was intended to cut through that uh, kind of natural response, and, and that was, why do you think that the homicide detectives have a higher clearance rate than you do if you're investigating non-fatal cases? And, and actually, we asked both sides <coughs> that question. And there was a remarkable level of agreement, and it was a much different story than the community won't cooperate or anything. It was that the homicide detectives have a lot more resources. Their caseload might be two or three at any one time. They can work a case for months. They have direct <laughs> access to the crime lab at, at the state levels. They get quick turnaround when they need evidence processed. Uh, and. The, on the other hand, the, the guys that are working, and gals uh, that, that are working the non-fatal shootings, 
also have to work auto theft and burglary, and they have a caseload in, in, of scores of cases, perhaps, at any one time. Uh, if they can't solve a case quickly, they move on, uh, even in non-fatal. So it's a very different response in terms of the resources. And so the, that, that um, told us something. Uh, and it, it seems only natural to think that the extra resources that are going on to the, into the homicide cases would matter. Uh, and yet, I think that the, the conventional wisdom is the reverse of that. Uh, there was an old RAND study uh, by people many of us uh, know or knew, Chapin, Greenwood, Peter Cilia, um, which basically cast doubt on the uh, productivity of detective work. And, and it said cases are either solved on the scene uh, because they're perfectly obvious or because an eyewitness steps forward. Beyond that, cases aren't solved. And, and that's the beginning and, and end of the story. You might as well lay off your detective squad because they're not accomplishing anything. Now, that is, would not be quite the, 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 the bottom line on it because uh, they do perhaps do some work after they figured out who did it uh, in preparing the case for trial and that kind of thing, but, but still, that, that's what it is. So what we were being told by the Durham uh, detectives was at odds with the Rand study. The Durham detectives said uh, that the resources matter a lot in doing these kinds of investigations, and that's why we're getting this huge difference in parents' rate. Unfortunately, they also had a second explanation that was equally popular, uh, which uh, is problems for us as evaluators, and, and that is um, surprising and interesting, and, and it is that the community is more cooperative if the victim dies, uh, and so that it's easier for us to get interviews with a potential witness and that sort of thing. I mean, remember, if the victim dies, you've lost a prime witness. <laughs> and so you'd think it would go the other way, but apparently you gain that victim's mother and the rest of the neighborhood who are more willing to take part for a variety of reasons. All right, so think about this. We now have two explanations for why there might be a, a big difference in the clearance rate. One is kind of an inherent greater level of cooperation, and the other is simply more resources. We wanted to treat this as a quasi-experiment, and the quasi-experiment was based on the notion that fatal and non-fatal gunshot cases, uh, in, in terms of the events that lead up to them and the circumstances in which they occur, are interchangeable, so other things are equal. We've actually just documented that in a, a paper we published uh, last year, to a large extent, uh, and you have far more resources. This seems like a good occasion to estimate the value of additional resources uh, devoted to, to non-fatal cases. Um, and then, of course, then there's this unpleasant business about the possible confounder if we do find a difference, which is community cooperation. Uh, so that, that's the puzzle we're faced with. And I, what I think of is the actual study that we're publishing is that it's um, sort of an experiment, but not quite. In fact, it, it got muddied up a bit. But you can follow our logic and see whether you uh, agree, because we think at the end of the day we have pretty good evidence that it is the resources that are making the difference. And of course, the, the policy context is the, the possible uh, possibility of improving the arrest rate. Th this little diagram might be helpful in thinking about it. Uh, and it also illustrates something that has been part of the literature since the time of the RAND study. And, and that is, if you, you think about how, what's the resource commitment on the part of the police department, in this case, the Boston Police Department, to a case where somebody gets shot, either fatal or non-fatal. And what we show is very low resource um, commitment will still be enough to clear some cases. You know, think of, think of the case, uh, it's a domestic violence case. The cop responds to the 911 call, and the shooter, most likely a man, 
is standing there with the gun in the hand and says, I did it. This is not that uncommon. And so that would be part of this group. It really doesn't matter what the resource commitment is. At the other end of the spectrum, a very high reason, you only get a clearance if, if you uh, put, put a lot of time and effort into it. And that might be the case where you pull a decomposing body out of the Charles River, you know, uh, a week after its demise, <coughs> and you have no other information about what happened. Uh, so a case that would require a lot of detective work, most likely to get it. We show two lines here. One is the non-fatal cases below the fatal cases because it's not just the resources. It might also be intrinsic cooperation from the community. Uh, and then um, suggest a, a possibility where the, uh, we end up with a higher <coughs> clearance rate for the fatal cases and the non-fatal cases reflecting both <coughs> processes. All right. So that's the setup. This incorporates the idea that cases are highly heterogeneous, and yet we're going to try to get at the median or mean uh, effect. OK. The data we were using was uh, for five years in, in Boston. The unit we're looking at is the case. The case is uh, most often a single victim who is shot, either alive or, or dead. Uh, but uh, about 20% of the cases, there were multiple victims. It's still a single case. And we call it cleared by arrest. If there's is just one arrest, that, that's enough. Uh, that will be a designated. And given, given Anthony's ability to collect data and, and the resources he had, we could collect data on all the homicides uh, during the five-year period, but only a sample, about a one in four sample, of the non-fatal cases. And so that's what we did. The data that uh, was collected included everything that was in the paper file, files, the electronic files, circumstances, victim characteristics, number of victims, gunshot, you know, the whole, whole story. And then we, uh, he, I should be clear about this, interviewed the detectives that were involved and asked them what was the key to solving this case if it was solved. So that we had qualitative data, we had the administrative data, the whole thing. All right, here's five findings that, that we had out of this. Uh, sure enough, first of all, that the fatal and non-fatal cases are statistically indistinguishable from each other in terms of the circumstances. For example, was it a drug-related case? Was it a robbery? Was it a domestic uh, violence case? Was it a case just based on a personal dispute? Uh, in terms of the characteristics of the victim, which we know in every case, uh, along the way we know the type of guns and, and so forth. Uh, so, in, in many dimensions, we can think of the gun homicides as a random drawing from the universe of shootings. And that's the, the basic quasi-experiment that we're looking at. There are a couple of dimensions which we can control for, like whether it's indoors or outdoors, which do, does seem to affect the fatality rate. And certainly, the caliber of the gun affects that. But the caliber of guns is randomly distributed uh, across different types of attacks. All right. The second finding that we have, so the first one kind of establishes the interest in this as, as a sort of an experiment with, with this exogenous, somewhat exogenous event of whether the victim lives or dies. Uh, the second thing we can say is that for both the, the fatal and non-fatal cases um, are both heterogeneous. And they're heterogeneous along the different ways that we can uh, measure, <coughs> including circumstance. Uh, and that circumstance uh, then relates to the clearance rate for each circumstance. So the lowest clearance rate that we saw was for the <coughs> cases that were designated by the police as gang or drug cases. 40% uh, of the fatals, 12% of the non-fatals were cleared. Personal dispute for both groups has a higher clearance rate uh, along the way. And for domestic cases, there weren't many of them, but all of them resulted in an arrest. Um, we used to have more domestic violence, or it was uh, relatively more important in violence 
that may be one reason why the clearance rates have come down a, a lot. Okay. So finding three, sure enough, the Boston Police Department collected a lot more evidence in the fatal cases. So the, their response was bigger. They had more officers that came to the scene. They conducted uh, on scene immediately following the shooting. Uh, um, more interviews with potential witnesses. Uh, they got online to check out possible suspects. Uh, more often, they uh, collected more video and checked it out uh, along the way. We, there, there were many dimensions that we, we could measure. There, we also looked at subsequent investigation and again found big differences between the fatal and non-fatal. So there's no question that the Boston Police Department faced with two groups of very similar cases was working a lot harder if the victim died. Not a surprise, not a surprise, given the way that they're organized along the way. These numbers, by the way, uh, might strike you as a little odd. It's because I decided to use medians rather than means, just to give a more typical indication of what's going on. All right, here's what I think of as the money slide. So you, you either buy it or you don't. Uh, <laughs> And it's hard to read, unfortunately. But this is um, where we look at not only whether there was an arrest made, but also when it was made, how long it, it took. And at the very end, uh, so at, at a, a year out, we have 44% uh, of the fatal cases by that time had resulted in at least one arrest whereas for the non-fatals it was 20%, okay? So that reproduces the overall finding. But look what happens back here. On the scene, leaving the scene uh, the same day, within one or two days, there's no difference. There's no difference at all. So I think of these as the low-hanging fruit, the easy cases, the domestic case where the guy has a gun. And then it starts separating along the way, and when you get out to a month, then you start getting a very sharp distinction uh, between the fatal and the non-fatal cases. So here's what I think is going on here, is that the uh, homicide investigators are able to stay with these cases. See, the, the non-homicide guys, they drop it after a couple of days and move on to the burglary or whatever it is that's waiting for them next. But the homicide guys have it in mind forever and they, they want to clear that case and it's very important. And they have the resources that will allow them to do that. So I, this, this I think is the most telling um, graph in terms of saying how can we distinguish between the two explanations the Durham police investigators had, whether it's cooperativeness of the community or is it resources, this looks a lot to me like resources, uh, just staying, staying with things. Okay. Uh, and the final thing we'd say, just as uh, Greenwood and the, the others found long ago, is sure enough, eyewitnesses are key to success. And in fact, that's a, a predominant feature of most successful investigations, both fatal and non-fatal. So over 60% of each, there was an eyewitness from the scene. Uh, and uh, there's also the, an important role for uh, the survivors. I mean, you might say, well, how can the homicide cases have survivors that are IDing the shooter? And, and I think the answer in every case was that there were multiple victims, some of whom survived, and those then were more willing to turn state's evidence along the way if one, one other member had been killed. So that's a, an anomaly, uh, but an interesting one. Uh, all right, so I, I don't want to deny that, that um, eyewitnesses are important. All I'm saying is, if you remember the time to arrest her, witnesses are often very hard to track down and convert to cooperators. 
that's a role for a skilled investigator that uh, can't be underestimated. All right. So the tentative interpretation here um, for shooting cases differ widely in what we call the intrinsic difficulty of solution. Not a, a very elegant term, IDS. Uh, and the, that the, the two groups of cases have similar distributions uh, of IDS, that seems reasonable. The easy cases are solved quickly for alive or dead, uh, but the extra investigation resources matter for the more difficult cases. Uh, and so, if you believe all this, then you say, ah, well, extra resources, that's something we know how to do, we as policymakers, uh, and that is uh, to either rearrange the police budget, take some money out of the stop and frisk activity or whatever they're doing the proactively, and put it back into detective work, or actually increase the overall capacity of the police. Uh, that, that doesn't, that's not rocket science, it's just budgeting along the way. And for many cities, gun violence is the most important problem they face. That's what they'll say. That's what Chicago says. That's what Durham says. It is number one. So it's probably worth it along the way. And we can tell them what to do. What they need to do is spend more money. Uh, now, there are other things that could be done if we could just get research on this topic. Uh, and we're trying to do it in Chicago right now through the crime lab, and I'm sure there's other projects uh, going on of this sort. Uh, but, uh, but this is uh, basically the situation. If we're, um, there's a, a refinement on this story is look particularly at non-fatal cases as uh, an attractive area to invest more money in. Uh, because if you think back to that diagram I showed you, on average, the marginal case for non-fatal shooting should be easier to solve than for fatal cases. Given that right now, those cases are dropped after a couple of days, it wouldn't take much extra to raise that a few percentage points. So that really looks attractive. In terms of the preventive effects of punishment, solving a non-fatal shooting is every bit as good as solving a fatal shooting. Incapacitation, deterrence, interrupting these um, epidemic type things. All right, so that's, that's the story.